Remember that the kinetic molecular theory allows us to explain why states of matter behave the way that they do. So not only can the kinetic molecular theory allow us to describe the properties of gases, but we can also describe the properties of liquids. A liquid differs from a gas because a liquid has a definite volume and takes the shape of its container. This is explained due to the stronger intermolecular forces between the particles. Remember that in a gas, the intermolecular forces were negligible because of the large distance between the particles. But in a liquid, the particles are much closer together, and the arrangement of the particles is more ordered, and so liquids are considered a lower mobility fluid than a gas. But both liquids and gases are considered fluids, and a fluid is defined as a substance that can flow and therefore take the shape of its container. So both liquids and gases will take the shape of their container, but a gas does not have a definite volume because it'll fill up whatever container it's in, whereas the particles of a liquid are much closer together, giving liquids a definite volume. This close arrangement of particles causes liquids to have a higher density than gases. Remember, in a gas, the particles are very far apart, and so a specific mass of gas has a very large volume, whereas the same mass of a liquid has a much smaller volume and therefore a higher density. Also compared to gases, liquids are relatively incompressible. Again, this is due to the close arrangement of their particles. Gases have particles that are very spread apart, and so you can compress them into smaller spaces by shrinking the distance between the particles. But liquid particles are already very close together, and so that makes them relatively incompressible. Because both liquids and gases are fluids, both liquids and gases are able to diffuse. It's just that a liquid will diffuse at a slower rate than gases due to the close arrangement of the particles. But like gases, the rate of the diffusion depends on the temperature of the fluid. In the picture to the right, there are two cups of water. The cup on the right has cold water in it, and the cup on the left has warm water in it. And when you add a drop of food coloring to the liquid, you can see that the food coloring disperses or diffuses through the warm water much faster than it diffuses through the cold water. This is because the particles in the cold water are moving slower and the particles in the warm water are moving faster. Surface tension is another key property of liquids. Surface tension is defined as cohesive forces that pull the liquid particles together that are along the surface. This creates like a layer of tension or skin across the surface of the liquid. Surface tension is what allows water strider bugs to walk across the water in a pond, or what allows you to float a paperclip on the surface of water in a cup. The amount of surface tension depends on the strength of the intermolecular forces. Water has incredibly high surface tension because water molecules are very polar. If you had another liquid that was less polar or even nonpolar, the amount of surface tension would be a lot less, and the insect wouldn't be able to walk across the surface, and you wouldn't be able to float a paperclip. Surface tension also causes the surface area to decrease, and this results in spherical droplets. And so when it rains, Water droplets tend to bead up due to their cohesive forces to each other, causing them to stick together and decrease their surface area. Related to surface tension is something called capillary action. Capillary action are the adhesive forces that pull a liquid upward along a surface. So rather than the liquid being attracted to other liquid particles, the liquid is attracted to the surface. And the liquid is pulled upward along that surface until the mass of the liquid is sufficient for gravitational forces to overcome the intermolecular forces. And when that happens, the liquid stops rising up the tube. And so what you'll notice if you take a capillary tube and you put it down into water, the liquid will climb higher in a skinny tube than it will in a wider tube. This is because the diameter of the tube is smaller, and so you'll need a higher mass to go above the surface of the liquid until the gravity prevents it from climbing any higher. Whereas in a wider tube, the same mass of liquid won't rise as high. When you have a capillary tube that's very narrow, the meniscus is much more noticeable than a capillary tube that is wide. What's also interesting about the meniscus is the way that the meniscus bends depends on the type of liquid. 
So here I have two graduated cylinders, and the one on the left contains mercury, and the one on the right contains water. You can see that the meniscus in the tube on the right is the typical meniscus that you see with water, where it's a concave shape due to the water clinging to the glass and being pulled upward by capillary action. Whereas in mercury, the cohesive forces in mercury are stronger than the adhesive forces against the glass, and so when mercury is placed into a tube, it forms a convex meniscus. Capillary action is important to all kinds of different processes. In chemistry, we often use capillary action to do a process called chromatography, where we take a solvent, usually like a rubbing alcohol, and we put the edge of a filter paper down into that solvent, and the liquid rises up the surface of the paper, causing inks and pigments to separate from each other. In biology, capillary action is really important for transporting water through plants. There are special cells that transfer food and transfer water. Those water cells are called xylem cells. Because the cells are so tiny, they create these really skinny tubes that stretch from the roots all the way up to the leaves. And because water is constantly evaporating from the leaves, it helps to create this continuous chain of water up the tree. Another property of liquids is their tendency to vaporize. Vaporization is the process by which liquids or solids change into a gas. Now there are lots of different types of vaporization. For example, boiling is a type of vaporization, and sublimation is a kind of vaporization, but we'll learn more about those when we do phase changes in a later section. Evaporation is a third type of vaporization. Evaporation occurs when particles escape the surface of a non-boiling liquid. The key difference between evaporation and boiling is that in boiling, vaporization is occurring throughout the entire liquid from top to bottom, whereas in evaporation, the vaporization is only occurring at the surface. Evaporation occurs because the surface particles are a little bit warmer than the particles below them, and so they have a slightly higher amount of kinetic energy. And when the kinetic energy is high enough to overcome the intermolecular forces, those particles at the surface change from a liquid to a gas. Again, because we're dealing with intermolecular forces, the strength of the intermolecular forces determine how quickly something evaporates. So if you have a liquid that is very polar and has strong intermolecular forces, it's not going to evaporate very quickly. If you have a liquid that has weaker intermolecular forces, like London dispersion forces, then it doesn't take much kinetic energy to overcome those, and they evaporate very quickly. Lastly, liquids can undergo freezing. And this is the physical change of a liquid to a solid by removing energy. Sometimes this is also called solidification. When you remove the energy, you're causing the average kinetic energy to become lower. And so the particles begin moving slower. And as the particles begin moving slower, their attractive forces become stronger relative to the kinetic energy and pull the particles into a more orderly arrangement.